Hey guys, we are getting ready to cover our renewable energies. This is one of the whole reasons we have our class is to learn all of the renewable sources of energy so that we can make the world a better place. Uh, yeah, it sounds cornball. All right, yeah, but remember this is what um, you guys are going to be focusing on um, as you get older, as you make decisions for your own homes, as you make decisions as far as laws and votings and what the government policies are. <clears throat> renewable energy is what we need to focus on so that you can make good decisions as you get grown. All right, so good luck. Here we go. All right, so here our main idea is what we're going to be studying and what we're going to be learning about. Let me get a pencil to, to write with. All right, so, oh, that's a highlighter. I'll try again. All right, that's better. Okay, so we're going to talk about why renewable energy resources have not been widely adopted. Okay, we know, um, basically we know that it's the oil guys and their subsidies and all this stuff. We're going to talk about that first, go over the details. We're going to identify the different sources of renewable energy and their applications, and then we're going to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each. We'll talk about passive solar, um, then active solar, then solar thermal systems. Yeah, big solar section. Photovoltaic cells, still solar. Okay, then we'll cover hydropower, biomass, biofuel, and geothermal. Okay, so we can use renewable from sun, wind, water, uh, geothermal, biomass. We can use all of these things to get electricity. And all of them, they're considered renewable because they're constantly replenished at no cost. Okay, that's a big deal. Replenished at no cost. Um, studies show that with proper government backing, now that's going to be the big issue, proper government backing uh, in the form of re uh, research, de research and development funds, subsidies, tax breaks, the renewable energy could give us up to 20% of the world's electricity by 2025. 20% is, is that's still small. We still have plenty of room to grow, but we need to get to there first. So what we need is the proper government backing to get us there. Okay. Um, the number could increase all the way up to 50% 50, uh, 50 by 2050. As of the time this book was written, there were 13 countries that had um, more than 30% of the electricity using renewables, which is very, very good. The U.S. wasn't there. The U.S. only had 13%. Okay. U.S. only had 13% by the time this book was written. With the proper government backing, we could bring it up to 20 really quickly, really easily. This is by 2025. All right. So hopefully, if things were still going on track as they should have been, by now, like I said, this book was written in 2014. So by now, we should be closer to that, I hope. All right. There's several. Uh, so the question up here is, why isn't renewable energy use um, in the U.S. expanding more rapidly. We know that it's a good idea. Why is it not expanding like it should be? Well, there's several reasons. First, people tend to think that solar and wind are too diffuse, meaning they, they're intermittent, they're unreliable, like the sun only works on sunny days, the, the wind only works on windy days. Well, that's we've found ways around it. Okay, we can make it work. All right, even when it's like today particularly, it's cloudy outside. We can make it work. All right, all you have to do is take the solar on the sunny days and stack up batteries. We can make it work. Same for wind. All right, or using combination of solar and wind in one place because if it's not sunny, it's probably windy, right? If it's cloudy, it's probably about to storm. So, you know, um, using both. Um, this, people say it's too intermittent, too unreliable, and too expensive. It's not anymore. Okay, these are all fallacies. These are wrong. This is what people think. Because it used to be that way, but it's not anymore. Um, these perceptions are very outdated. Okay. Um, second, there's a lack of government support, and that is true. Okay. There is definitely a lack of government support. Since 1950, government funding, tax breaks, subsidies for research and development, the, the, the stuff we want for renewable energy has been much, much lower than that for fossil fuels and nuclear. They'll open their pocketbooks for fossil fuels and nuclear way earlier than they'll open their pocketbooks for renewable, and it shouldn't be that way. Okay, you can the the money maker people. The reason they're opening pocket pocketbooks is so that they can make a profit, right? That's the reason the government's going to give anybody anything is that they think that there can be a profit made, and there can be in renewables. You can make lots of money in renewables, and they just need to to learn that and do it. And third, while the government subsidies and tax breaks for renewable have been increasing, Congress has to renew them every couple of years. Okay, when when you're doing it right, okay, the tax breaks and the subsidies have to be renewed every year, and so that hinders the investments of renewables. But 
the trouble is the fossil fuels, the subsidies and the tax breaks for fossil fuels, somehow or another, they've gotten out of the renewal process. They've gotten a pass. You're, when you have a subsidy for something or the government helps you pay for something, you're supposed to every year renew that subsidy so that you know that you're doing the right thing. Somehow or another, the fossil fuels have gotten a pass on these renewables. And so they've, they've got them, uh, the lobbyists in the fossil fuel industries have had them guaranteed for decades, their renewables, their um, subsidies guaranteed for decades, whether or not they still need them and whether or not they still deserve them. Somehow or another, they worked out a trick with the government that they don't have to renew their subsidies. They don't have to go back for reevaluations where the, the, the good renewable energies, they're doing things the right way. So they go back for their reevaluations every year, just like they're supposed to. It's a long drawn out process. And so if the fossil fuels get a pass and they don't have to go back for reevaluations, then the renewables shouldn't have to go back for reevaluations either or if the renewables have to make the fossil fuels do it as well it's only fair this is what we're talking about the 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 there is no fairness there is no equality there is no um they don't do it right the fossil fuels and the lobbyists of the fossil fuels have twisted everything <clears throat> there's another reason we so said we still want we're trying to figure out why we haven't been able to start our um start our renewables the fourth reason here Again, if this is the fourth reason, it sounds like there's a list. Make sure you're paying attention. The fourth reason is that the prices for the non-renewable resources don't include the harmful environmental and health impacts. Remember how we said that if if we made the fossil fuels and all these bad guys pay for the damage they were doing, pay for the health cost, then all of this stuff would be much more expensive. We call it, remember, full cost pricing. All right. So the fossil fuels and and the nuclear, they don't they don't use full cost pricing. They hide the environmental damage. They hide the health cost. They don't add it to the price where the renewables, because we're doing it right, we include any damage that we're going to do in the price <clears throat> so that the free market competition is skewed and twisted. The the um, the fossil fuels are shielded from free market competition. And finally, the last point, the reason, the last reason that we we're not able to get this, the renewables done like we're supposed to, is history shows that it takes about 50 to 60 years for a transition from one dominant fuel to another. So it's it's a slow switchover, such as from wood to coal and then coal to oil. Okay, so it, uh, history shows it takes a long time to switch over. And so the renewable and wind are still the world's fastest growing industries. So if you're looking to make some money, renewables like wind and solar, I keep looking this way because my face is in front of the picture here, but I've got it up on my projector so I can see what it says. All right, so that's why I keep looking over here. So anyway, the wind and solar are the fastest growing. So if you're looking for somewhere to invest, wind and solar would be it. Even so, it's likely to take many decades before we can get up to 25% or so. It's going to take decades because it's a really slow transition. All right, so what are our sources of renewable energy? We know this answer pretty much. What are our sources? Okay, renewable energy is energy that's naturally replenished and comes from the sun, flowing water, wind, and Earth's interior, and biomass. A lot of times you can remember wind and solar, you know, you can remember water and usually you can remember geothermal. OK, biomass is not one you automatically think of all the time, but biomass is I'll, I'll go into more details if you're not quite sure what that is in just a little while. But biomass isn't one of the ones when you're asked list all the bad ones, fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural glass, nuclear. Those are the bad ones. List the good ones, solar, wind, water. And sometimes you can remember geothermal. But now we need to remember biomass as well. Biomass is one of the good ones. All right. So. The renewable energy will get cheaper if we get rid of the inequitable subsidies. Inequ inequitable means they're not fair. Okay, we just talked about this. The subsidies are inequitable. They are not fair. It's not fair between the bad ones and the good ones. The inaccurate prices, all right, because the fossil fuels are cheating. They're not counting the environmental damage or the health cost. And then the artificial low pricing of the non-renewables. 
Like I said, they're not including the environmental damage or the health costs. They have all of these subsidies from the government, and they don't have to renew them every year. They've gotten a pass. So if we fix all of these things, then the fossil fuels are going to get more expensive, and it's going to be more... Um, It'll be, it'll be more of a good idea to go ahead to the renewables. So let's start with solar. Okay, solar heating systems. The first one we'll talk about is passive. Okay, passive heat solar heating. Okay, so solar heating has several applications in home and businesses. Different types of solar heating can help to heat the interior spaces, heat the water, and then solar can also be used to produce electricity. So, so you can use it to heat the building. You can use it to heat the water. And you can use it to make the electricity. So we're going to talk about the different ones. So a building that has enough access to sunlight can get all or most of the heat through passive solar heating system. Okay, passive means you don't have to do much. You just set it up and this, the sun handles it. So such systems absorb and store energy directly from the sun within a well-insulated airtight structure. Now remember when we talked about super insulation on the last one, right? So you have to have well insulation. It won't do you any good at all to 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 try one of these if all of the heat or the cold, whichever the case may be, is going out through the windows and the walls. So you can get what you need, the energy directly from the sun within a well insulated airtight structure. Water tanks and, and walls and floors of concrete. Okay, you have water tanks and then you have walls and floors of concrete, adobe brick or stone, can store much of the collected solar energy as heat and then it's slowly released. Because, you know, think about um, if you have uh, stone, the sun heats the stone during the day and then the, the, it starts to let it come off, re-radiate re back out. So a small backup system is probably going to be used to provide additional heat, but it's usually not necessary, especially somewhere like, uh, like around here. An active solar heating system is going to capture the energy from the sun by pumping a heat-absorbing fuel. This is why passive just means the sun hits the sun hits you and warms you. Active means you actually have to pump a heat-absorbing fluid like water or an antifreeze solution through special collectors. And then the collectors are mounted like on the roof or on racks that face the sun. And some of the collected heat can be used directly and the rest is stored for use later in large insulated containers filled with gravel or water or clay or some sort of chemical to hold that heat. All right, so these um, active solar heatings, again, the passive ones is where the sun is just coming in the window, warming up the house. This is an active system where you actually have to pump a heated fluid around, and then that warms things up. You're pumping this heated fluid. And so these roof, they're up on the rooftop. These rooftop active solar collectors are used to heat the water in many homes and apartment buildings. One in 10 houses in China uses this to... Um, it costs about $200 to hook this up. It's really, really cheap to hook it up. And once you have it hooked up, the hot water is heated for free. Free, forever. The hot water is heated for free. All right. In Spain and Israel, the builders are required to use these rooftop solar heaters on the, all the new buildings. It won't work to keep anything cool, so it won't do us much good. All right. But, um, but, we can use indirect solar energy, mostly wind, to help cool the buildings, right? So this is kind of obvious, like cooling breezes to keep the air moving. If there's no breeze, you know, using fans, all the stuff, you know, it's that's kind of ridiculous. Um, but um, sorry, sorry, there was an announcement came across the thing and I was just processing it. Okay, so... Um, Taking advantage, like opening windows and using fans and stuff, that's, you know, kind of, yeah, that'll help cool some places. It won't cool Memphis, but, you know, we'll get into that later. All right, so <laughs> it works some places. So, still, again, we're still talking about the active solar heatings. Other ways to naturally keep the building cool cool includes blocking the sunlight with shade trees, broad overhanging eaves, awnings, and shades. A light colored roof can also reflect 90% of the sun's heat compared to 10 to 15 on a dark colored roof. So again, this is going to be important for you guys as you get older, um, maintaining your house. Okay, when you when you have a house, and sometimes you at least once, probably twice, you'll need to replace your roof on your house. All right, so 90% 90, 90 of the sun's heat can get reflected if you have a light-colored roof. And a green roof will help to absorb extra heat. So we wouldn't want that here. You would not want a green roof here. All right, if you live somewhere like Wisconsin or somewhere where it's cold, then maybe. 
Um, the homes with geothermal heat pumps can use them to pump cool air from underground the buildings during summer. And then, um, oh, I can't see what this says under here. Um, we're going to get a little later. Um, oh, this is the picture listing the advantages and disadvantages. That's what that is. Okay, so here is our solar heat pumps. Okay, the, the this is the passive. Okay, over here, this is the passive solar heating. All right, the sun just comes in, and in the winter time, the sun is lower, and that you have this on, you have this planned. All right, so the the sun is coming here. The, building your house in the right direction to make this happen. I think this is north south. Okay, the summer sun, the sun is higher. Okay, so it's going to hit this. You want to have a light colored roof to have it bounce off, and a nice awning on the side here to keep it from coming in the window. The winter time, you want it in there. All right. You're also going to want to put shade trees. Okay, that's one of the things we just said. Shade trees. All right. This vent here. Okay. Um, the vent is good. You know how it heats up down here, and hot air rises. Okay. So this vent allows it to come through here. You have nice heavy insulation, so you're not losing it if you don't want it. The white or light colored roofs, we're going to reduce overheating, and the super high efficiency window. Okay. This and a stone floor down here for heat storage. Okay. Now this is the active system. Okay. This is the active solar system. Okay. You have your solar collector up here on the roof and these pipes going through that pumps, that pumps this superheated liquid like a um, antifreeze kind of stuff. All right. And this is, would be your water tank. All right. So this heats up your water tank. Again, you have your super heavy insulation and then you have down here this heat exchanger. Okay. So this is the hot air cup, the hot water fluid coming this way. And this is the colder. So it's going to pull. So this is going to collect some of this and bring it around for the rest of the house. Okay. So these are the heat exchangers in here. And then again, you have your um, radiators or something to force the air ducts. So it helps to um, keep the house warm. Okay. And then again, you have your high efficiency windows. So once you've got it heated up, you don't lose it. So this is the passive. You don't do anything, just let the sun shine. This is active. You actually have pumps and you're pumping this fluid around to do to make your changes. But again, you're still using both. You have your white light colored roof. Okay. You have your, um, you'll put a shade tree up here also. You, a shade tree would probably be on this side. Okay. You'd want your shade tree. All right. So passive and active solar heatings can heat water and buildings effectively. The costs of using the direct sunlight to the high temperature are coming down. Okay, like I said, it's less than $200 to set the thing up. And then once it's set up, it's free. Sun's going to shine. You don't have to pay for that. All right, the passive solar heating that absorbs and stores the heat directly from the sun within well insulated structure, and the active is going to capture the sun's energy with that heat absorbing fluid. Okay, sort of like an antifreeze, but not exactly. All right, we can cool the buildings naturally. A lot of technologies. Okay, open the windows when it's cooler. This is so stupid. Okay, yeah, we know this. Open the windows when it's cooler outside. Use your fans. Okay, use that super insulation that we talked about in the last chapter and the super high efficiency windows so that the heat doesn't escape. Overhangs or awnings, light colored roof, the geothermal pumps. Okay, like I said, and I'm going to talk some more about the geothermal pumps when we get into the geothermal section. Those are actually pretty amazing for what they can do. The solar solar thermal systems, also known as concentrating solar power. Okay, these use different methods to collect and concentrate the solar energy in order to boil water to produce steam for generating electric, electricity. So what I was just talking about a minute ago, the active and passive solar heating is to heat a building. This is to produce electricity. Okay. All right. So again, as we talked about many times, to to make electricity, you just have to boil water. And again, this is using the sun to boil water. And then you make the steam and you use that to generate electricity. We've talked about this many times. You have the steam, okay, that spins a turbine. And once the turbine spins, you've got electricity because you have a magnet of, remember we said there's a magnet, of, magnet and a coil of wires. You get one to spin and the other to be still. It doesn't matter which one spins and all it takes is a turbine. So you're boiling water to spin that turbine to generate electricity. And these are used in deserts. Okay, and in other open areas with ample sunlight. We have several of them here. Okay, we have several of them here um, in, in the Memphis area. Okay, 
so because we have so much sun in the summertime. So one such system uses a row of highly curved mirrors called parabolic troughs, which you don't have to memorize that, just know mirrors, to collect and concentrate sunlight. Each trough is going to focus the incoming sunlight on a pipe that runs through the center and is filled with synthetic oil. The oil heats the temperatures as high as four, uh, 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and that heat then is used to boil the water to produce steam, which powers the turbines and produces electricity. Let me know, please. I need to show you the picture. We'll see the picture in just a second, but it's the mirrors here concentrating the sunlight on this tower in the center. Other solar systems use an array of computer-controlled mirrors to track the sun and focus the energy on its central tower. So the computer-controlled mirrors are great because the sun is steady moving all day. This concentrated heat is used again to boil water to produce steam that drives the turbines for electricity. The heat produced by either of these systems can be used to melt a certain kind of salt that's stored in the large insulated container. And then once you have this molten salt system, you can, the heat can then be released as needed on at night or on cloudy days. All right, so you can use the sun's energy to heat up this oil that's going to boil the water. Or you can do this molten salt at night or on cloudy days because it will hold the heat long enough to keep it boiling even if the sun's not out. So in 2014, the world's largest solar thermal plant um, opened in the Mojave Desert. It cost $2.2 billion. Um, it has 350,000 mirrors and has enough power for 140,000 homes. So that's a lot of power that's been produced there. People can use solar thermal systems on a smaller scale as well. As some sunny rural areas, people use inexpensive solar cookers. If any of you guys were Boy Scouts of any time, you, you can take just a box and line it with aluminum foil, and you can have a solar cooker. It doesn't take much okay, to focus and concentrate sunlight for boiling and sterilizing water or cooking food. Uh, the solar cookers can replace wood and charcoal fires, thereby reducing the indoor air pollution, which is a major killer of people in less developed nations. If they're burning wood in their house, you're going to get carbon monoxide poisoning, okay, if they don't have good ventilation. These solar cookers can fix that. Um, and also the fact that it's reducing the deforestation by lowering the need for firewood and charcoal that's made from firewood. And because the solar thermal systems have a really low net energy, um, if you're going to most of these, if you're going to use them on time, they're going to use them on a large scale, you're going to need subsidies, okay, because they have a pretty low net energy. Subsidies are tax breaks in order to allow them to be competitive. But like I said, this is good renewable energy. So we could take some of the subsidies that they're given to, to nuclear or take some of the subsidies that they're given to fossil fuels and put them here instead. That I mean, yes, they're going to have to have subsidies, but stop giving them to the wrong people and start giving them to the right people. All right, so the solar thermal systems, concentrating solar power. Here's that picture I was, show, I was talking about. These are those mirrors, and they focus the sunlight up onto this tower in the center. And um, there's like a special oil in this that um, can be heated up to almost 700 degrees, and then they use that to boil the water for the electricity. Or in some of them, there is a special salt, not French fry salt, but a special salt that will melt and as that salt is melting, um, it holds the heat so that you can still get your electricity on um, cloudy days and at nighttime. So they collect sunlight to boil water to make steam. And these arrays of mirrors will track the sun and focus the energy. Uh, then solar cookers are the small scale. Um, you can just individual houses. And the disadvantage is it has a low net energy, so it's going to need subsidies. It uses a lot of water when you're boiling this water and when you're cleaning the mirrors. And it can dis disrupt the desert ecosystems, which are usually very um, delicate. And you're going to need a backup system on cloudy days. But like I said, that molten um, salt thing could be an option for cloudy days. Now, solar cells, these are the, the photovoltaic cells. This time, you're not boiling water, okay? These are going to convert the energy direct, the solar, solar energy directly into electrical energy by using these photovoltaic cells, okay? The way that they work is um, they're made of a material that when the sunlight hits it, it gets excited and it shoots off an electron. 
the there's a the sunlight hitting the solar cell creates it to agitate the atoms inside of it when it agitates the atoms it shoots off an electron and once you have one shot off you remember because they're negative you have positives and negatives and the negatives like charges repel they can move them okay once you have one electron shot off then you can create a chain reaction and have a whole bunch of electrons following in a line and that's all you need for electricity is electrons in a line okay electrons moving down a wire is all you need okay that's what electricity is to create electricity i told you you need turbines and magnets but that's the thing that gets the electrons moving down the wire the electrons moving on the wire is what the electricity is and so with the solar panels the sun hits it it starts to agitate the material in there and it shoots off an electron and once you get one moving the others will follow in a line so the solar cells are the world's fastest growing technology for producing electricity large-scale solar plants are operating in Portugal Spain Germany uh, Germany South Korea and in and southern US southwestern so between 2008 and 2014, uh, the cost per watt of electricity fell by more than 83%. They used to be crazy expensive, but they're not anymore. And they're expected to keep falling. So we've got a plenty of, um, not only do you get subsidies and tax breaks for installing them, they are not costing as much as they used to. Most of the solar cells are very thin, transparent wafers of purified silicone or some other polycrystalline stuff. Um, and they produce electricity flowing electrons when the sunlight strikes them. Like I said, they just get agitated and shoot off an electron and then you can start them moving down the chain. Many cells wired together in a panel can produce large amounts of electricity and such systems can be connected to existing electrical grid systems. So you just connect them to the current grid and they can be connected to batteries also that will store the electricity when the sun's not out. So you have the sun shining and it's recharging a battery for that evening. Okay. People can mount the arrays of solar cells on the rooftops. They can incorporate them into almost any type of roofing material. It doesn't have to be a special roof. You can incorporate it into the stuff you're already using. And they're also developing ways to make solar cells that can be attached or embedded to other surfaces like outdoor walls or windows or even drapes your curtains. Okay. So you have the window closed, the sunlight's hitting your curtain and you can, ha and you can have it, even clothing. If we look, spin back at the explorers at work, she's got some really cool information there for you. Okay, the solar power providers in Japan, Britain, India, Italy, they're all putting floating arrays out on the surfaces of lakes and reservoirs, ponds and canals. They're sending, just having the solar panels floating out on the water. And so the engineers are also developing dirt and water repellent coatings to keep the solar panels and collectors clean without having to use water. Because think about it, if if the solar panel is always getting dirty, you're going to have to wash it down. Imagine how much water that's going to waste. You take the hose and just hose it down. Okay, that's actually a lot of water to be wasting. So we have to be very careful with our water waste. So they've actually been able to um, develop coatings on them to keep them clean without having to use the water. Solar cells have great potential for providing electricity in less developed countries. We had several questions dealing with this on our um, enrichment worksheet. Nearly 1.3 billion people in the world, almost one out of every five, live in rural villages that are not connected to any electrical, electrical grid. So one out of every five people. We're very lucky here. Okay. Worldwide, one out of every five doesn't have electricity. And a growing number of these people are now using solar cells to generate electricity. They can use the solar cells to power highly efficient LED lamps like we see here, and that will that will replace the polluting kerosene lamps. Again, these kerosene lamps, um, because you're burning that kerosene, a lot of people are um, asphyxiating. It's causing indoor air pollution and it's making everybody sick and sometimes killing them. So um, all of these off-grid systems, uh, as they reach more and more rural villages, are going to help hundreds of millions of people lift themselves up out of poverty. And that is an amazing benefit way more than just getting electricity, but lifting these people out of poverty. The solar cells have no moving parts, no need for water for cooling. To operate, They operate safely and quietly without emitting any pollutants or any greenhouse gases. That's pretty impressive. Okay, however, the conventional solar cells do contain some toxic materials in them that have to be recovered when the cells wear out after 10, 20 to 25 years. So they're created with some toxic chemicals that you can't just throw away. 
all right? Um, and so the solar cells, are, they're also not carbon free when they're talking about uh, fossil fuels are used to produce and transport them. All right, so they do have, so they, they don't have, they're not completely carbon free. But these emissions are very low when you compare them to the emissions released everywhere else, okay, gen generating renewable and non-renewable resources. Okay, I'm going to pause this right now. And so go to the next screen and pause. Okay, so solar cells are going to typically convert only about 20% of the incoming energy into electricity, but that is getting better rapidly. They are getting much, much better at this. In 2014, the Germans were able to get 45% um, solar energy put into electricity, and they're working really hard to make this commercially available, which means somebody's about to make a killing because they figured this out. It could be one of you guys. Y'all can figure this stuff out. So solar cells should be becoming a lot more cost effective within the, within the next decade or two. And the cost to produce solar cells with thin film nanotechnology, like again, if you uh, they talked about it a little bit in chapter 11, but um, those other, other mineral materials are expected to fall to a point which they can even compete with the fossil fuels, especially coal. All right, so it should be even cheaper than using coal. So, the photovoltaic cells, or PV cells, um, convert the solar electric energy directly into electrical. It's the world's fastest growing technology. And so with the design of solar cells, they're very thin, transparent wafers of silicon. Sunlight hits them. Uh, the material in it gets adjective, shoots off an electron, and then one electron follows another down the wire, and that's what electricity is. Uh, so then you have arrays of cells made up of panels, and uh, these are the ones that you can put on almost any surface, and they have great potential in less developed countries. So the key problems with solar energy, it's a high cost of producing electricity. It has to be located in sunny desert areas, or it, it's better to be in sunny desert areas. There are a lot of fossil fuels used in the production, though production and transport, they're still using a lot of fossil fuels. And they do contain toxic materials that you'll have to consider when it's time to get rid of them. Um, they have to be replaced every 20 years or so, 20, 25 years. So you'll have to deal with that. And all of this, the, the cost would drop with mass production and new designs and government subsidies if we would subsidize the good guys, all right, and tax breaks. Okay, so subsidize the good guys and then things would go a lot better. All right, and these listed are listed here for you, okay? I think I put them in your notes as well in the different particular places. All right, hydropower, let's talk about the water now. Okay, technology that uses the kinetic energy of flowing water um, or falling, flowing or falling water to produce electricity is known as hydropower. So it's using kinetic energy, meaning the energy of motion. Do you remember that from physical science. Okay, the energy of motion, the energy of flowing or falling water. This renewable energy resource is an indirect form of solar energy because the sun creates the wind. All right, so it's an indirect form of solar energy. Uh, produces part of the Earth's solar-powered water cycle. Okay, so um, you know, like the sun creates the wind and moves the water. All right, so the heat from the sun causes the surface of the water to evaporate into the atmosphere, and then the water t returns to Earth in the form of rain or snow, which may be deposited. It's the water cycle. <laughs> okay, y'all know the water cycle. Okay, the heat from the sun causes the water to evaporate into the atmosphere. The water returns to the Earth in the form of rain or snow. Lolly, lolly, lolly. Y'all remember the, the water cycle. No, I will not be testing the water cycle. Sorry. Man, I would have got that one right. <laughs> No. All right. So hydropower, though, water, is the most widely used renewable energy resource in the world. Okay. It's most widely used in the world. In 2015, hydropower produced about 16% of the Earth's electricity in 160 countries. That same year, only about 7% in the U.S. Like I said, we are way behind on all of these. Almost every one, we're behind. But half of that, half of this, we reproduced about 7% and about half of that was used out in the West Coast. Um, in order, the top three producers are China, Brazil, and the United States, China, Brazil, and the United States. So we're still one of the top three, but compared to worldwide, it's not that great. As of 2013, according to the UN, 13% of the world's potential for the hydropower had been developed. Um, the countries with the greatest potential for more 
hydropower is China, India, South Africa, Central Africa, and parts of the former Soviet Union. Okay, so these are the guys who have the most water available to be made, the potential. All right, the most common approach to harnessing water, okay, is to build a high dam across a large river called a reservoir. Okay, you build, you, you have a river going, you build a dam, it stacks up on the back here, and then you let it come down, and as it's coming down through the, uh, this is the dam, it's, the water is really high back here and low down here. So as it falls down, you make your electricity. So the water stored in the reservoir is allowed to flow through large pipes at controlled rates. The flowing water causes the blades of a turbine to turn, which in turn is going to produce energy. The electric lines will then carry the electricity where it's needed. The volume of water flowing through the system, along with how far it drops, is going to determine how much energy is, is generated. So if it's a small drop, there's not going to be a lot, but if you have a really high dam and a really long drop, you'll get even more energy. Well, yeah, where's the mouse? There. Okay, so a new technology called micro hydropower, you know the word micro means small, right? Micro hydropower generators can become increasingly important way to produce low cost electricity with minimal impact to the environment. You can put these on a little stream. Okay, a little stream behind your farm or whatever. So the generators are little floating turbines, each one about the size of an overnight suitcase. They're not big, okay? Little um, floating turbines that can be placed in any stream or river without altering its course. You don't have to mess anything up. You don't have to damage the environment. And most of these systems can produce enough electricity to power a moderate-sized home, okay? As far as 1.6 kilometers, about a mile from the creek. Okay, I call it creek because it'd be small town people. Okay, but you can go about a mile from the little river that you're using, and the thing's about as big as, as an overnight suitcase, and from a mile from the river, and you can and, uh, power your house with micro hydropower. It's really, really great potential. See? Oh, good, there's a picture. Okay, so here's the creek, all right? And here's where you have this little micro hydropower. This isn't actually um, a big setup. You wouldn't have to do this much. Okay, but here's the flowing water part. This is where the um, the micro hydropower system is. This is where the electricity comes, and it brings the electricity to the house. And then the water goes back to the creek. This is kind of like what I suggested doing for, for the Mississippi River on a big scale. We could do this here in Memphis easily. Divert a portion of, if this was the Mississippi River, okay, this wouldn't be micro hydropower. This would be huge and enough to do almost half the city probably easily half the city with completely renewable and we wouldn't need um, fossil fuels at all. You just divert a little bit of the Mississippi River um, and run that Miss river down here through the turbines and run those turbines onto the electrical grid and then let the rest of it flow back into the river. You haven't even, you haven't even messed up the shipping lanes. Okay, you know, because those boats are going back and forth through here. You didn't even mess up the shipping lanes. You just took a little bit off to the side, okay, and then ran it through the turbines and then run your electricity. One of you guys could set this up for Memphis and you'd be incredibly rich. Okay, so hydropower is the least expensive of the renewable resources. Okay, once a dam is up and running, it's a source of energy. The flowing water is free, annually renewed by snow and rainfall. You don't have to keep adding to it. It is free once you set it up. The process by which hydropower plants generate the electricity doesn't cause pollution. There's no pollution being made, okay? However, the reservoirs will release some methane, okay? In the bottom of those lakes, before you filled it up, there was grass, there was plants, okay? So as those plants are gonna decompose in the water, you're gonna get some methane released. However, that's only during the first year or so. After that, that stuff is decomposed and it's not gonna keep releasing methane. It's only going to release meth methane while that stuff decomposes the plants that used to be in that area. Teachers, Sorry. The uh, and then methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Okay, so we don't really want it, but um, it's only going to be within that first year while the, the grasses that were there start to decompose. Despite all the potential, though, for the water, the useful time may be limited. Okay. Um, the use of the large-scale hydro 
plants is expected to fall slowly over the next several decades because many of these existing res reservoirs are going to fill with silt and dirt. As, as the river's bringing the dirt and stuff, it fills up behind the reservoir and then it's get more shallow and more shallow. It's going to be useless, okay, as the, the river deposits more silt. That's what you call the fine sediments. Um, and so the new systems have to replace them, but they're not being built quickly enough. The electricity output of the hydro plants may drop if the atmospheric temperatures continue to rise. Global warming. Global warming is going to stop this from being useful. Okay, if the atmospheric temperatures continue to drop to rise, the electric output of the hydro plants is going to slow. Uh, this is going to be caused because the melting of the mountain glaciers, the primary source of the water for some of these facilities, is not going to be there for them anymore. Okay, so if we continue to melt the glaciers, you're not going to have anything to run these hydropower plants. People can also produce, oh, this is energy from the oceans. Now this is a really, really cool idea. This is like the frontier of a lot of this stuff. So people can also produce electricity from flowing water by tapping energy from the tides and waves. The tides come in twice a day, okay, up by about 12 to 15 feet. Okay, and then back down again. So you can use that up and down portion to get your electricity. And the waves, of course, are going nonstop. You can use that energy. In some of the coastal bays and estuaries, the water levels rise about 20 feet or more between daily high and low tides. And then the dams can be built across the mouths of these bays and estuaries to capture that tidal energy for hydropower. Although currently such sites are rare, it's not going to happen everywhere. Okay, you can't find them all the time, but in the places that you can find this, where the it's like the mouth of a river that's going out into the sea. Okay, you can you can dam up the side of the estuary, and as the tide comes up, you you hold that water back behind there, and then you let it fall. Okay. Now, wave power would be really, really amazing, okay, because those waves are going to go constantly. I've got a picture to show you what that kind of setup would look like if you're trying to tap a wave. I'll tap the electricity off a wave. All right, but for decades, scientists and engineers have been trying to produce electricity by tapping into wave energy along the seacoast where there are almost continuous waves. And they estimate that if you could harness the world's wave power at an affordable cost, now that would be tricky, it has to be an affordable cost, you could provide more than twice the amount of electricity that the world currently uses. So forget fossil fuels, forget nuclear, forget even solar, forget everything, just wave power. You could get twice what the whole world would need. That's pretty impressive. Okay, so the production of electricity from tidal waves is currently limited, though. Okay, challenges include a lack of suitable sites. We can't find good places to set this up. Um, citizen opposition, okay, because if you're going to the beach for a vacation and all of a sudden you see a power plant out there in the middle of the ocean, it's not really pretty. Okay, um, so there's definitely some citizen opposition. It costs a lot, and of course, there's going to be damage from the saltwater corrosion and storms. So you have to be able to, it has to be able to handle all that saltwater, and it has to be able to handle the hurricanes, because if you're on the ocean, you're going to have a hurricane. All right, so you have to be able to handle all that stuff. Here's the, here's the pictures I'm talking about. So these are turbines down in here. As the waves go in and out, okay, look, if you look, this turbine is facing this way and the other turbine is facing the other way as far as I can tell, okay, as the waves go in and the waves go out, okay, that's one way to get this to work. Another way, these things rise up and down as the waves push them up and down and that up and down motion is what causes the electricity to go. So either one of these would be great um, as far as um, on a coastline. Now again, remember there's like citizen opposition. Um, this wouldn't look very pretty out if you're expect, trying to have like a family picnic on the beach, um, but it doesn't look that big and you know, you could set it next to a pier or something, you know, it wouldn't, or even under a pier. You could set this under the pier and then have the walkway across the top, you know, the boardwalk where people go. All right, so, I mean, it's not like a problem. You could easily make this work. Um, just for the idea of how much possible energy, but the idea of the corrosion from the salt water, that's a big issue, and the um, storms, okay, damage from storms, that would be a big issue as well. But, I mean, we can overcome anything if there's money involved, so if they would subsidize the right guys, okay, there'd be money. All right, so the advantages of high power, you have a very high net energy, okay? It's not often we get to see high net energy. Hydropower has high 
net energy. Large untapped potential, low cost, low emissions, okay, and other no no air pollutants in the in the temperate areas. All right, and you have the trouble is large land disturbance and displacement of people when you have to build that dam because there was a small river, okay, flowing through and, and the animals and the people had set up next to that small river. But if you're building a dam, it's a huge area, okay, for what used to be like this is now huge. All right, so then you're going to have um, methane emissions, like I said, for that first year or two while that biomass is decaying, okay. But it's not going to be long. It's only going to be that first couple of years that methane is going to be being emitted as that stuff decays underneath there. And then, of course, you have disruption of the downstream aquatic ecosystems. If something is relying on that water downstream, all of a sudden you have it dammed up to make electricity. They're not getting the water downstream, um, at least not at the same pace that they used to. So, I mean, all of those things are, you know, advantages and disadvantages. So it would depend on the site. All right. So. We can use the water flowing over dams and tidal flows and ocean waves to generate electricity. Um, environmental concerns and limited availability of good sites may limit the use of these. So the tides and waves would be a very, very good one. Okay, we could pr produce electricity from flowing water, the ocean tides and waves, coastal bays and estuaries. Okay, there are very few suitable sites though. It has high cost to set up and uh, the equipment can be damaged by storms and, corrosion, storms and corrosion. So if we could handle that stuff, then we could make this work. Let's talk about wind though. Wind is the winner. Okay, of all the types of renewables, all the good ones, the wind is the best of the good ones. Okay, just remember that. The wind is the best of the good ones. Okay, since 1990, the wind power has been the world's second fastest growing source of energy after solar cells. Okay, it's the second fastest. In 2013, the wind farms in more than 85 countries produced about 3.5% of the world's power. Enough electricity to serve 500 million people. Okay, so that's only 3.5%. We could grow that a lot. Experts predict by 2050, this number could grow to 31%. So an increase from 3.5 to 31 means somebody is available to make a lot of money. I'm telling you guys, if you are looking for something to invest in, investing in wind power would make you guys a fortune, a fortune in this area. Okay, many energy analysts feel that the wind power has more benefits and fewer serious drawbacks than any other wind source. Okay, we were always talking about advantages and disadvantages. Okay, this one has way more advantages and way smaller disadvantages. It also has very huge promise. Studies suggest that wind power could potentially produce 40 times what the world currently needs. 40 times. Think about all the energy that the world uses right now. What if we had 40 times that available from wind, which is not going to damage the earth? It's amazing. It's, it's, it's just freaking amazing. Okay, in 2014, the U.S. led the world. This is one thing we're doing right. The U.S. led the world production of electricity from wind, followed by China and then Germany. In 2014, electricity produced by wind turbines accounted for about 4.4% of the total energy in the U.S., equal to that produced in 60 large nuclear reactors. Okay, so 60 nuclear reactors get, can give us the same amount as the wind that we have. And we don't need the nuclear. Don't let anybody ever tell you we need nuclear. D don't. I mean, when you're voting and making policies. Wind power is the second, fa second fastest growing source of energy after solar cells. The U.S. is the world's leading producer. When we include the environmental cost of using energy resources the market price within the market price, wind is the least expensive way and the least polluting way. Least expensive and least polluting way to make electricity. This is why I said wind is the winner. Wind is the winner. Okay, it is the least expensive way to make electricity and it's the least polluting way. The frontier of wind energy is offshore wind farms. We were just looking at some of the um, the waves patterns. Okay. Um, offshore wind farms. The winds are generally much stronger and steadier over coastal waters than on land. One of the problems that they say that they have with wind farms is the wind isn't always blowing. Well, okay. Offshore on the coast, it is. 
the winds are almost always blowing. So being able to capture their energy can reduce the cost of electricity production and offset the higher cost of building the offshore compared to building on land. Okay, so if you locate a far enough offshore, the wind farms are not visible. Some people will say they're an eyesore. And again, if, if you're trying to have a family vacation at the beach, you don't want to see a wind farm, but you can push them far enough off, offshore. And again, when we talked about smart grid on the last section, the smart grid means you can have further distance. Okay, it can be you can have further distances between electrical um, facilities. So building offshore is going to also eliminate the need for negotiations among multiple landowners. You don't have to buy the land. If you want to put a if you want to put up a wind farm, you need to own that land. But if it's offshore, you don't have to argue with anybody or buy anything. Arguing over locations of the turbines and electrical lines, you don't have to worry about that. The offshore wind farms have been built on the coasts of 10 European countries, as well as in China and Japan. Um, using wind to produce electricity is an important step towards sustainability. Okay, so we have these long turbines that can extract more energy from the wind. Rapidly growing power source, US, China, and Europe. The future is the offshore wind farms. And wind power has the potential, like we said, to produce 40 times what we need worldwide. These are different types of, of wind turbines, okay? This one is going to spin, okay? This one's going to spin like this. This one is the one we're used to seeing that looks like a helicopter or a small biplane. This one is going to spin in a circle like this, okay? Um, this one is, is spinning also in a circle, and this one. Different ones um, have different... Uh, applications what i what i've always thought is having something like this or this on the highway think about it on the highway where the the median between the two the two highways you could have these placed along the median and then the wires going down to local um, power companies but as the cars go by that would um as the cars go by that would make the turbine spin all right, so why don't we do that? And if you set them up, you'd have to have some sort of, these would be pretty good because if you have like a car accident and somebody crashes into them, um, you, you don't want sharp spinning blades, but this wouldn't, wouldn't be sharp. Okay, this would just be, you know, regular trash on a, you know, there's going to be trash if there's a car accident. But if you separate them, send them about every 15, 20, 30 feet, along the interstate then as the cars go by they would have them spinning and that would be an extra way to make electricity and it wouldn't matter if it was a windy day it just matters if you have traffic and here in memphis we have traffic all right so that would be another thing to set these up along the highways the wind power has many many advantages wind is abundant widely distributed and inexhaustible as long as the sun's shining we're still going to have wind wind is power is mostly carbon free and pollution free mostly carbon free because there is some in the production of the metal and the pieces you have some carbon going on there a wind farm can be built within nine to twelve months and expanded as you need it so you can start small and build it big i'm talking to you guys about making a million dollars right here okay you can build it within nine to twelve months and expand it as you need it and although wind farms may cover large areas of land the turbine themselves occupy only a small portion and what i mean by that Oh, it's going to tell you right here. Okay, so a lot of the U.S. landowners are favorable wind areas are investing in the wind farms because you're going to get about 3000 to 10000 a year in royalties for each tur each turbine. 3000 to 10000 a year for each turbine. I'm telling you, there's money to be made here. Okay, the land can still be used for other activities like growing crop or grazing cattle if you already have a farm in your family. Or if you want a farm in your family, you put a couple of wind turbines on it and then you put your farm around the wind turbines. All right. So consider that an acre of land in northern Iowa planted corn can produce about a thousand dollars worth of ethanol fuel. But one turbine on that same site can get three hundred thousand dollars worth of electricity. So planting corn for ethanol, you, one acre of land is going to get you one thousand dollars one wind turbine is going to get you three hundred thousand dollars you guys have got money you got money signs in your head yet 
All it takes is a little bit of land. So the wind power also has medium to high net energy. Okay, so the Department of Electricity and the World Watch estimate that if we were able to apply full cost pricing, like I said, we need to make sure that the fossil fuels are paying full cost pricing. If the good guys are paying full cost pricing, then the bad guys should too. So if, we, if we're applying full cost pricing factor by including the harmful environmental and health costs to the various energy sources, then wind energy would be the least costly way to produce electricity. Wind power does have drawbacks. The land areas with the greatest wind power potential are often sparsely po populated and remote. There's a lot of empty land. So the, you have to have roads needed to deliver the, the turbines to the areas. As a result, the smart grid could connect these wind farms wherever they're located. And because winds are unpredictable, you really need a backup power, such as like um, natural gas or solar to, require, to generate your electricity when the wind is not blowing. But a smart grid could also combat that because the smart grids are able to let other areas take up the slack. So that's another benefit for the smart grid that we talked about in the last section. Alrighty guys, so now we're ready to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of the wind. Um, it is abundant all over the place, widely distributed and inexhaustible. As long as the sun's shining, we'll still have wind. And the earth is spinning, which neither one of those things is going to end anytime soon. It has a very high net energy. Remember, that's the whole thing we're looking for is the high net energy, very low cost to make this electricity non-polluting. And then when I got started talking about wind, yes, there are disadvantages, but I said even the disadvantages aren't really that big of a deal. The largest potential areas are usually rural, and by that we mean the roads are difficult to get the um, turbines through. But imagine there's not that many back roads. We've got roads. All right, and you need a backup power source on calm days. Yes, that is a problem, but there's a lot of options. You can combine solar and wind. They usually work alternate to each other or even natural gas if you have to, okay? And they may be considered noisy and an eyesore, and whoever is complaining like that, they're just being petty, all right? So yeah, so even the disadvantages of wind are not real disadvantages. Um, so we've got them here. High net energy, wide availability, low electricity cost, little or no direct emissions of carbon dioxide or other air pollutants, easy to build and expand. Okay, you need a widespread smart grid. Okay. I'm sorry, the intercom's on. So you need to have the smart grid. That's one of the things that um, is probably a requirement. You have to have backup or storage system when the winds die down. The appearance may be considered an eyesore, but again, people who would say that are just being petty. Low level noise might be considered bothersome and potential to kill birds and bats if not properly located. Well, <laughs> okay, they'll figure out where it is real quick and they'll navigate, they'll be different. They'll move different areas. So even the disadvantages are not really disadvantages. All right, now again, here's the offshore wind when you combine the wind and what we talked about the wind, I mean waves. A minute ago we were talking about the waves and how they're constant. They're going all the time without stop. Those waves don't ever stop. If you combine that to wind, which also on the coast, the wind doesn't stop. You combine those two things and you've really got something going on. So these are three different types and there's a, there's a when my head is not in a wave, there's a website who goes over this at the, um, this is the, uh, energy.gov. This is the U.S. energy site. Okay, so first one here, this is a spar buoy, okay? And I think this spins like this as the waves are going through, um, or it goes up and down and uses the kinetic energy. I'm not sure how that's working. Of course, then you got the wind up top. And this one, I'm pretty sure this one goes, just rides up and down. These are like little plunger things. They ride up and down, and this one uh, does um, a tension leg. Um, so as this goes up and down, it's almost like a rubber band or like a, the bouncy things that the little babies on the, the babies on the swings when you hang them on the doorknob and the little kids sit on that bouncer jumper thing. It's something like that, that the waves move it up and down. And of course, each one of these has the wind going at the same time. So these just have some sort of wire probably here underwater connecting them up to the shoreline that's going to take it to the electric grid. So any one of these three, um, uh, systems would be an excellent opportunity. Um, think about the coast, uh, Louisiana, I mean, Tennessee doesn't really have an ocean coast anywhere, um, but think about the, we could do this on the, the Mississippi River. We could do it um, on the 
for Tennessee, we'd have to do it on the river. But think about um, the coast of Mississippi and the coast of Louisiana. We could set this up out there very easily, okay? And with the smart grid system, that's not too far away to bring it to us and we'd be able to use it. <clears throat> now, biomass and biofuels. Remember I talked about earlier, um, if you have to list the bad ones, you can do it, okay? Coal, oil, natural gas, and nuclear, those are the bad ones, the non-renewables. And then if you list the good ones, you got most of them. You got solar, wind, water, and you can do geothermal. Usually remember geothermal, but we almost always never remember biomass. Okay, so this is biomass. Okay, so it's the energy that's produced by burning solid biomass or organic matter found in plants or plant-related material. Think about <clears throat> if you are having a picnic and you have corn on the cob for your picnic. Think about how much plant material is not eaten when you eat corn on the cob. You have the whole stalk, you have the green around the outside, you have that fluffy yellow stuff. All of that stuff is not eaten. You only eat the corn on the cob. Well, what if you use that, the rest of the stuff that you're not eating as fuel? Okay, so th this is what biomass is. Okay, think about potatoes. Okay, if you're, you're peeling potatoes. Okay, you've got the potato part, but then the peels. Uh, a lot of people just go ahead and eat them along with everything else, but uh, you know, you got the potato peels. You've got um, all sorts of things that um, biomass Okay, the energy from biomass can also be converted into gaseous or liquid biofuels. So either you can burn them solid, again thinking corn stalks, you can burn them as they are, or you can convert them into a gas or liquid and then use that as biofuel. So the biomass fuel is used for heating and cooking. It can also be used in industrial processes. And then of course, if you can boil water with it, you can generate electricity. So examples of biomass fuels include wood, wood wastes. Think about sawdust, right? When you're making something, you got all that sawdust. Okay, so wood and wood waste. Charcoal that's made from wood. Agricultural waste like sugarcane stalks. After you take the sugarcane off, you got the stalks. You got rice husks. You got corn cobs. Okay, so yeah, I didn't even think about that when you have the corn. You've got the stalk, you've got the green on the outside, and then you've got the cob after you're done with the corn. All right, so all of these things can be considered biomass and they can be burned. So wood is one of the main things when we talk about biofuels. Wood is renewable only if it's not harvested faster than it can regrow. It's only re renewable if you take it at the speed it can replenish itself. The problem is that 2.7 billion people around nearly 80 less developed countries face a fuel wood crisis. Um, there's actually, I think you may have seen it in the renewable video um, it's a fuel wood crisis where they're actually if you look at it on a map there is a protected safari type area in one edge of a country and over this the the state line okay is a very very impoverished area okay the people in the impoverished area have cut every tree down that they had possible for fuel it looks like dry nasty no trees left right next to the line where the safari area is where the land is protected so the people in the fuel wood crisis the po the poverty stricken people are sneaking into this country stealing wood and sneaking back so that they can have wood for their fires which again i talked about with solar if you can get them solar instead that's a much better uh, much better solution so these people are in a fuel wood crisis. They're often forced to meet their fuel needs by harvesting trees faster than the new ones can replace them. All right, so one solution is to plant fast growing trees. There's particular types of eucalyptus and several trees that'll grow really, really fast. Fast growing trees and shrubs and perennial grasses in the biomass plantations. So I have a whole plantation just for biomass fuel. However, the repeated cycles of growing and harvesting, growing and harvesting, growing and harvesting on these biomass plantations will deplete the soil nutrients. Okay, and that plus that area should probably be used to grow food crops. Okay, we also have the trouble with the spread of non native tree species that can become invasive very easily. All right, so if you're planting this fast growing tree in an area that is not normally supposed to be, it's quite likely it can become invasive. So wood as a fuel is probably not the best choice. And of course, burning that wood or burning any biomass, okay, is gonna produce carbon dioxide. When you burn anything, you get carbon dioxide. So clearing the forest and grass lines to provide fuel also reduces biodiversity and the amount of vegetation that would otherwise capture climate changing carbon dioxide. So again, 
making these plantations is not really a great idea. Okay, burning the wood and other biomasses can produce carbon dioxide and other pollutants like fine particles in the smoke. In 2014, in 2014, the EPA proposed phasing in stricter regulations to curb the pollution from the non-residential burning stoves in the U.S. beginning in 2015. So we're tr the their EPA is trying to put on stricter and stricter scan uh, restrictions on wood burning stoves because it is producing carbon dioxide when you burn wood. All right, so biomass advantages and disadvantages. In some areas, you have a lot of it available, um, but you have a potential increase in deforestation. It doesn't cost all that much, but you're going to damage the ecosystems from clear cutting, soil erosion, water pollution, and loss of habitat. It has a medium to net energy, but if you're trying to grow these fast growing trees, you're going to probably have invasive species. They're probably going to take over and um, crowd out the natural trees. There's no net carbon dioxide increase if you harvest and burn it sustainably. So if you cut one down and plant another and don't wait to, and don't cut it till it's grown, okay, if you can do it harvest uh, sustainably. But you're going to increase the emissions if you harvest and burn insustainably if you don't do it fast enough. And plantations might help to restore the degraded lands, but then again you're going to have the loss of biodiversity when they do that. So um, biomass is that organic matter found in plants or plant-related material. Examples would be fuel, wood. Uh, uh, examples of biomass fuels is wood and wood waste, charcoal, um, crop race, wastes. You can use it for heating, cooking, industrial processes. And again, if you can boil water, you can generate electricity. And the wood is only renewable if you don't harvest it more quickly than you plant it. And there's a fuel wood shortage in many less developed countries. All of those things are things to remember when we're talking about biomass. But biomass can also be converted into liquid biofuels for use in cars. Okay, Liquid biofuels is really, really easy to mix with the gasoline or use in place of gasoline. The two most common biofuels are ethanol, which is made from the plants and plant wastes, and biodiesel from vegetable oils. All right. So the biggest biofuel producer, again, biofuel is made from plants. Um, U.S. first, making ethanol from corn. Then Brazil, making ethanol from sugarcane. And then the European Union, which is making biodiesel, which is vegetable oils. Okay. Then China is next in line, producing ethanol from non-grain plant sources to avoid diverting grains from the food supply. Now, this is important that China is doing this. Nobody else is doing it. They are using non-grain plant sources so that they don't take food out of people's mouths. Here in the U.S., we're making ethanol from corn, and it's taking food off the tables. It's taking food off the tables. So we didn't care so much about it because we're so fat and happy and we can get what we want when we want it. But China is being careful not to use food that's going to take from somebody's plate. The biofuels have three major advantages over gasoline. Um, first, the biofuel can be grown without, throughout the world with um, the help of more countries to reduce their dependence on oil. Okay, so you don't need oil if you can use the biofuel. Second, if the growing new biofuel crops keeps pace with harvesting them, okay, there's no gonna, not going to be any new net increase. All right, so if you cut them in the in the if you're growing them as fast as you're cutting them, you're not going to increase any more carbon dioxide emissions unless the existing grasslands or forests are cleared to plant biofuel crops. If you're cutting down forests to plant corn, you're not doing it right. Okay. Third, the biofuels are easy to store and transport through existing fuel networks. We already have everything set up to send the gasoline around, so biofuels will follow the same networks. And they can be used in motor vehicles without, with very little additional cost. It doesn't take much to switch your car over to a biofuel. Switch it off of gasoline and onto biofuel. It doesn't take much to change your car over. So the biofuels are gaseous liquid or motor vehicle fuels derived from biomass, corn, sugarcane, vegetable oils, plant and plant wastes. The advantage is they can be grown in many places to help reduce dependence on oil. There's no net increase if you do it with careful harvesting, and it's easy to store and transport. Corn-based ethanol, though, is not a great plan. This is when we say we're leading biofuels because we're doing corn-based ethanol. Corn-based ethanol is not really a good idea. 
Corn-based ethanol is not really a good, good idea. In the U.S., most of the ethanol is made from corn. The government heavily subsidizes this fuel. So somehow or another, the corn-based guys have gotten the same deal from the government as the fossil fuel guys. Okay? It, it subsidizes because it has a low net energy. Remember, we don't want anything with a low net energy. It's not worth it. So... <coughs> The intercoms, I'm sorry. So fossil fuels are being used to make the fertilizers, to grow the corn, and to convert the corn to ethanol. So biomass biofuel is not really green. They'll say it's corn-based ethanol, it's green energy. Well, it's not really green energy because you're using all these fossil fuels to make it. Okay, recent studies have shown that the corn-based ethanol program in the U.S. take has taken more than two million hectares or 5 million acres of land out of soil conservation reserves, an important topsoil preservation program. So not only are these guys as sneaky as the fossil fuel guys, they are taking conservation land to grow their ethanol corn. They are taking protected land. These guys are as bad as the fossil fuel guys. These corn-based corn ethanol guys, mm-mm. Other studies have concluded that burning the corn-based ethanol adds 20% more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere per unit of energy than gasoline does. It actually is putting more greenhouse gases even than gasoline does. And they're not going to tell you that when they put it up for a vote. Oh, let's do corn-based ethanol. It's green. It's, it's renewable. We can plant more corn and we can get more ethanol. We don't need oil. Okay. But you're taking conservation land. It You get 20% more greenhouse gases than you do from gasoline. This is not a good requirement. The growing corn also requires substantial amounts of water and land, resources that are short supply in most areas. You take a lot of water to make this stuff, and water is another thing that we have to be very careful not to waste. Furthermore, the scientists warn that large-scale biofuel crop farming reduces biodiversity, degrades soil quality, and increases erosion. It will also push the small farmers off their land. When these big companies come in that have the big government subsidies, they're going to bully everybody else around and push the small farmers off their land and drive up the food prices if it becomes more profitable to grow corn and other crops for biofuel rather than to feed livestock and people. Again, they are taking food off of people's plates. They're taking food off of people's plates. And so recent studies confirm most of these warnings. As a result, the number of scientists and energy economics call for withdrawing all government subsidies from corn-based ethanol. Stop giving the wrong people money. And then sharply reduce the large amount of ethanol that's currently required in U.S. gasoline. They make you put it in there. And if ethyl ethanol makes more greenhouse gases than, than gasoline does, then why are we putting it in the tanks? So there are advantages of biofuels over traditional. The biofuel, biofuel crops can be grown nearly anywhere, helping to reduce the dependence on oil. There's no net increase in carbon dioxide emissions if you are growing them carefully, if growing them takes pay, keeps pace with harvesting them. The biofuels are easy to transport. <coughs> the disadvantages, growing it removes land from the conservation efforts and it reduces the biodiversity and degrades soil quality. It uses large, large volumes of water and increases the erosion. And then burning it adds even more greenhouse gases than burning gasoline does. Not a good plan. Corn-based ethanol, not a good plan. Okay, so if corn-based ethanol is so bad, we have this other option called cellulistic ethanol. Okay, it's an alternative to corn-based ethanol. This is produced from the inedible cellulose that makes up the biomass, like leaves and stalks and woods and chips. So we're not actually using the corn. This time we're using the trash. Okay, stalks, wood chips, that kind of stuff. One plant useful for this is a, uh, is a plant called switchgrass. Okay, switchgrass is a prairie grass that grows even faster than corn, and it's very hardy, it doesn't require nitrogen fertilizers, and it produces ethanol with a medium net energy. Remember I said the corn-based ethanol was low. This is medium. So switchgrass is a pretty good option, however, it's not quite yet affordable, and growing the switchgrass requires even more land, 
than the corn does. And so if you're growing switchgrass, you can't really use the land for anything else. The, the animals don't really eat it. Uh, you can't have it like as, you know, it's not really a great option. And a lot of research is needed to determine whether the environmental impacts that might grow with towards, you'd be taking up a lot of land to grow switchgrass. And it's not really, it's better than corn-based ethanol, but it's not really a great choice either. So the ongoing challenge is going to be to grow biofuel crops using more and more sustainable agricultural methods, such methods that would require less irrigation. We don't want to waste all of our water on it. It should also limit land deg degradation, air and water pollution, limit greenhouse gas emissions from the tractors and such. All right, and then threats to biodiversity. So again, threats to biodiversity include, you know, taking up that whole land to blow to grow a single monoculture, land that could be, you know, all sorts of ecosystems. Now they're all going to be lost. In addition, any system that's used to produce biofuel is going to have moderate to high net energy has to so that it can compete in the marketplace without subsidies. Announcements again. All right, because it has to be able to compete without the subsidies. If you have to subsidize it, it's not worth it. So is biodiesel the answer? Okay, so biofuel wasn't the answer. Okay, maybe biodiesel is. It's produced from vegetable oil. Okay, and so the European Union uh, produces 95% of the world's biodiesel. The crops are going to require large amounts of land to make the vegetable oil. Okay, and it also that production requires fossil fuels. You have to, you know, you have to run the tractors, you have to run the collecting equipment, you have to run the harvesting equipment, and then you have to put it on it. You have to do whatever production it takes to turn a plant into an oil. Okay, that's a lot of production, and then you're going to have to put it on a truck and travel it somewhere. So all the production is going to require fossil fuels as well. Again, ethanol is one of the biodiesels. This is one we talked about, that um, the biofuels, okay, uh, ethanol is made from sugarcane, corn, switchgrass, and U.S. is the largest producer. We make it from corn, and it has a low net energy, so this is not a good idea. Not a good idea. Brazil is second place. They use it for they use their sugar cane, and they have a medium net energy when they do it, so it's a little better. And then you have that cellulosic ethanol that is used from just plant waste. Okay, the cellulose. Cellulose is the stuff that's in the plant cell wall. Okay, so this is uh, the cellulosic ethanol. Okay, so problems with cellulosic es cell cellulosic. I don't even care how you say it. Okay, the chemical processes are still being developed. Growing enough of the switchgrass is going to require too much land. So we're evaluating the use of algae and bacteria. Okay, algae and bacteria for, um, especially algae, for the biodiesel is one of the best options out there right now, especially with what we're, we're discovering from it. So the using algae as a biofuel. Okay, so the efforts are underway to find alternatives to the corn base, and one approach and use one approach involves using algae as biofuel. As a crop, algae can grow rapidly year-round in various aquatic environments. As I said, using aquatic environments, what if you what if you are having a sewage treatment plant or a water treatment plant? You're using algae to clean your water, and then you use the algae as biofuel. Okay, so you're getting two jobs done at once. So the algae store their energy in natural oil within the cells. Okay, so if there's oil within the cell, and that's where you get the biofuel. This oil can be extracted and refined to make a product very much like gasoline or biodiesel. And remember, we said that the biodiesel, um, it's very, very, very easy to switch your cars off of gasoline and into biodiesel. So it would be very, very easy to use this algae-based fuel. The major benefit of the process is that algae is going to be using up carbon dioxide all the time that they're doing their work because they do photosynthesis. This algae is doing photosynthesis all the time. And so as you are growing this algae in order to be your crop, the algae is sucking up carbon dioxide, helping the global warming. So the, the algae is sucking up carbon dioxide while you're growing it to make your energy. Okay, um, make the, because of this, it is carbon neutral. All right, so currently extracting and refining the oil is costly. So there is oil in the plant cell, of the algae plant cell, and of the algae, the cell. I'm trying to figure out. 
They, the algae store their energy as natural oils within the cell. Getting the oil out of the algae cells to be able to use and refining it is a little bit costly right now. So more research is needed on which types of algaes are the most suitable and the ways of growing them that are the most successful and affordable. But again, if we stop subsidizing the bad guys, let's see, <laughs> the announcements again. Sorry, if we stop subsidizing the wrong people, giving all of that money to fossil fuels, giving all of that money to nuclear, if we gave it to these guys instead, they could find ways. If you give it to them for their research and development, you can pay people to figure out how to get this cheaper. Whether it's the production, which algae makes the best money, the best bang for your buck, so to speak, they'll find it. They will find the right answers if you can give them the subsidies so that they can afford to do their work. If you can't pay your researcher to do his job, then he's not going to be able to do his job. Instead of giving the subsidies to the bad guys, give the subsidies to the good guys in their research and development. So the algae are much, much smaller than corn, of course, and we're going to require no farmland at all because they can be grown very quickly even indoors. Set you up a greenhouse inside. Okay, a large amount of algae can be grown from a, in a single room. And see, this is this is the production going on right here. Okay, this is this is the water treatment facility idea. All right, and algae we are going to absorb carbon dioxide from the air. Okay, so they're pulling up carbon dioxide, helping us with global warming, and they convert it in the process to the biofuel products which we use to make a living. We sell it, we make money. So the algae are helping us deal with global warming, then we turn the algae into biofuel and we sell it. Win-win. Win-win. There's no other way to say that. Okay, algae is the one of the best ways to get this going. And so this, when enough political support exists, again, you have to, government has to stop paying the wrong people. When enough political support exists for the development of a product, technological advancements can be expedited. Meaning if the government wants it to happen, they will pay for the people to figure out how to make it happen. So they'll, they'll, that means expedited, speed it up. The advancements can be speeded up as has been the case with cell, solar cell technology and programs for corn-based ethanol. When the government wants it to happen, it will happen. So with enough pressure from us to tell the government, this is where we want you spending our money. And that's why I'm telling you guys, because this is what you're going to be deciding when you're doing your voting. You tell the government where to spend your money. Tell them you want them to spend it on this. Okay, algae has amazing potential as a source for producing biofuel. It can grow extremely quick quickly, producing whole crops that don't require farmland. And a large amount can be grown in a single room and algae will absorb carbon dioxide from the air as it converts it to biofuel products. However, there's more research needed to bring down the cost and improve the methods for producing the fuel. Okay, that's what's expensive right now, getting the fuel out of the algae. So we need more research for that, which means we need the subsidies for that. So if you go to the office of uh, of energy efficiency and renewable energy visit visit this you can actually tell them that they, they will let they there are places where you can converse with them this is the government the the energy.gov site and um, the question here is do you think the government is adequately committed to producing this alternative biofuel you can tell my opinion right away I don't think we're putting enough money in here right now and I think that's where we need to do stop giving the money to the oil people okay stop giving it to the fossil fuel guys Give the money to the right people. Okay, so the advantages and disadvantages of biofuel. Okay, so they're going to reduce the carbon carbon dioxide emissions for some crops. Okay, medium net energy for biodiesel from oil palms, medium net energy for ethanol from sugar canes. All right, so the threat to the food supply if the fuel crops are going to compete with the with the food crops. Like I said, if you're growing corn-based ethanol, you're taking food off somebody's plate. This is another reason why algae is such a good idea. We don't eat algae. Okay, you're not going to take food off of anybody's plates. And then um, the invasive spread of some fuel crops. Remember we said that if you're growing those fast-growing trees, they can get invasive very easily. The low net energy for corn-based ethanol. That's why they're being subsidized, and they should not be. There's nothing good about the corn-based ethanol because it has higher carbon carbon dioxide emissions than gasoline does. Okay, that's a definite, definite bad disadvantage for the corn-based ethanol. We need to be focusing all of our energy on algae. 
Okay, so geothermal. Okay, so unlike other forms of renewable energy, they all come from the sun, either directly or indirectly. Like water, that's driven by the sun. sun solar, of course, is driven by the sun. Wind is driven by the sun. All of those others are driven by the sun. Geothermal is heat from the earth. Okay, couldn't care if the sun is out or not. Okay, so the geothermal is heat in the soil, underground rocks, and fluid in the earth's mantle. So the geothermal energy can be used to heat and cool buildings. You can use the uh, heat and cool water. And once you can boil water, you can make electricity. Announcements. Okay, so you can use it to heat and cool buildings. You can use it to heat and cool water. And you can use it to produce electricity. It's available around the clock, but it's only practical as sites with high enough concentrations of underground heat. And what we're going to find out, though, if you go deep enough, you can use this anywhere. You don't have to have volcanoes nearby. This is not just volcano places. All right. All right, so... What you'll do is you'll dig down into the down here into the ground, okay? And um, you throw cold water down here, and then steam comes back up, okay? It goes down cold and comes back up hot. Once you've done that, you've got the steam here to spin your turbines and start your electricity. All right, so, um, oh, I forgot you can't see the thing until I actually make marks. Okay, so it goes down cold, okay, down through here, comes back up hot, up this way. And once it's hot, it goes through here. Here's the turbines to spin and create the electricity going out. All right, that's all you have to do is just drill down deep enough to get to it. So the geothermal energy heat stored in the soil, in underground rocks, or in fluids in the Earth's mantle. It has great potential for supplying very many areas because you don't just have to have volcanoes around with the heat, electricity, and it has a generally low environmental impact. In these areas, um, yeah, it doesn't take much. You don't have to tear up much land to make this happen. The sites where it can be produced economically are somewhat limited, but we are increasing the um, technology to use this in more and more and more places. All right, so the geothermal heat pump, okay? This is the one I was kind of halfway talking about a minute ago. This geothermal heat pump can heat and cool a house almost anywhere in the world, okay? It makes use of the fact that the temperature deep inside of the earth is um, 10 to 20 feet down is 50 to 60 degrees year round all right so if it's winter time and it's 20 degrees outside 50 to 60 is beautiful if it's summertime and 100 degrees outside 50 to 60 degrees is heavenly so the earth is this temperature all year round so we can use it in the winter and in the summer so during the winter time you have this closed loop of buried pipes you have to have like 10 to 20 feet down under the ground under there's under your foundation it's going to circulate this fluid that pulls the heat from the earth and carries it to a heat pump which transfers that heat into the home's heating system and then in the summertime it works in reverse bringing the heat from the house down into to the below ground okay it brings the heat down out of the house the EPA estimates that a geothermal heat pump system can heat or cool a a 2,000 square foot house, which most of ours are smaller than that, a 2,000 square foot house for as little as a dollar a day. And it usually pays for itself in about three to five years. So it's three to five years to pay off. So it's kind of expensive on the front end. But once you have it, three to five years, and then it's going to offer the most energy efficient, reliable, clean, and cost effective way to heat or cool indoor spaces. So it takes a bit of money to set it up. Once you do it, though, it costs almost nothing to run, and it's going to do a really, really good job of heating and cooling. Heating and cooling. You don't often get them both. Okay. Again, that's the geothermal heat pump that can go underground in anybody's house. You don't have to live near Yellowstone National Park, or you don't have to live near Hot Springs, Arkansas. You don't have to live near Iceland where the volcanoes are. They can do this anywhere. All right. Now, a hydrothermal reservoir, that's a little bit different. Okay. Engineers can also tap down into deeper, more concentrated areas of geothermal energy. Now, this is where you'll have to actually have some. Okay. Called hydrothermal reservoirs. The wells are drilled down to the reservoirs to exact dry steam that doesn't have very much water or wet steam that does or even just hot water. Now, this is like hot springs in Arkansas. The steam or water is then used to heat the buildings, provide hot water, grow vegetables in greenhouses, okay, that's pretty handy, raise fish in aquaculture ponds, and spin turbines to produce electricity. All of this water can be used for all of these things. 
This source of energy is used in 24 countries, including the U.S., the world's largest producer of electricity of hydrothermal reservoirs. And again, they have a lot of this in Yellowstone National Park. They have this in Little Rock, um, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Okay, but most of the production is California, Nevada, Utah, and Hawaii. And it meets the, the needs of 6 million people. Okay, that's pretty imp impressive to be able to handle this for 6 million people. In 2015, there were 134 new geothermal plants under construction or in development in the U.S. And when completed, they could triple the country's electrical output from geothermal energy. So, again, this is really, really um, wonderful for the areas where this can happen. Another source of geothermal energy, now this is crazy, I had not heard of this one at all, hot dry rock to create steam, okay, um, hot dry rock, which is five kilometers or basically three miles or more underground everywhere, you go down that deep, the rocks are going to be hot, <laughs> you're, you're that close, you're getting close to the mantle now, you go down three miles, the rocks will be hot. All right, so what you do is you take water and inject it down through the wells drilled in the hot, dry rock. That water hits these rocks and bounces back up as steam. Okay, so all you have to do is be able to drill three, three miles down. And that is anywhere. Again, you don't have to have volcanoes nearby. You don't have to have hot springs nearby. You just drill down. The rocks are going to be hot that low. So, this, uh, the, so you throw the water down in there. It's going to absorb the heat, become steam that's brought back up to spin turbines to make electricity. And again, this can be done anywhere. So what if we took currently standing coal electric, electric plants? What if we take the electric plants that are currently running on coal? We don't have to do anything. We don't have to change anything. Just on that exact same site. That way we don't mess up any other environmental land. We don't mess up any other ecosystems. We take the currently standing electric companies. Drill a hole three miles down, throw water down the pipe, bring back up steam to spin the turbines. It's hot everywhere that low. You don't have to have a special place. So according to the U.S. Um, Geological Society, tapping just 2% of this could produce more than 2,000 times the amount of current electricity being used in the country. 2,000 times more electricity than we're getting currently right now. For geothermal, and it's not going to pollute. You're throwing water down and getting steam up. You didn't do anything but drill a hole. That's all. And that's all you have to do. And it doesn't even matter where you are. Three miles down. Throw steam. I mean, throw water, get steam. And then you use that steam to spin your turbines. The limiting factor is cost. I mean, it, getting a hole three miles down. Okay, it's going to be expensive to dig that hole. Um, but more research and improved technology is going to increase or lower those costs. All right, so some call for the use of geothermal fracking. All right, it's, it, it's fracking just like we did when we were talking about the fossil fuels, getting the natural gas. Um, it has those same kind of techniques in there. But again, you're going to have trouble with the earthquakes, the exact same earthquakes that you have with the fracking. All right, so that's you know not really a great idea. And also, every time I hear the word fracking, I think somebody's cussing. So... <laughs> That's general, generally something on the downside there. But the just drilling the hole three miles down, that's not fracking. That's just do it, just drilling it down. And so if we just did that in 2% of our current um, electric companies, just drill a hole just in 2% of them, then we'll have 2,000 times more electricity than what we have right now. So again, this is the, um, so this is the same, this is the, this is a, a picture of the geothermal reservoirs. This is hot, hot liquid water down in here. But the same concept will be happening with the hot dry rock. You just drill a hole. It doesn't. This one here doesn't have to be as deep. You have to go three miles down for the dry rock. All right, the hot dry rock. But if you go three miles down, throw you some cold water down there, you're going to get steam coming back up. Okay. So again, and use that steam to spin your turbines. All right, so the geothermal heat pump system, this is the one that's in people's houses, okay? It's energy efficient, reliable, environmentally clean, cost effective to heat and cool a space. This geothermal heat pump system, that's the one where you're using the, the fact that the ground is, is uh, 50 to 60 degrees world year round. This is in individual homes. Okay, then hydrothermal reservoirs, these are where you drill the, wall, the wells to ex extract steam that's automatically under the ground. These are only work in those particular places. 
where water and stuff is is in the ground and the u.s is the biggest productive producer for that but then you have this hot dry rock idea that can be done anywhere as long as you can get three miles down water injected to the rock to produce steam all right so the geothermal problems we do have some problems with this it's kind of expensive to tap these hydrothermal reservoirs all right and there's a scarcity of suitable sites for some of these um, there is some noise and carbon dioxide emissions while you're working and it could possibly create earthquakes with that fracking idea that they were offering. But again, you don't have to do that. Just dig the hole three miles down. Okay, so hydrogen fuel is the next of the renewables that we're going to talk about. Uh, they say like the fuel of the fuel of the future is hydrogen gas. And the focus has developed right now on making hydrogen fuel cells. Okay, it combines um, hydrogen and oxygen all right, to make electricity and water vapor. So um, here's the formula to make it happen. You just take two hydrogens, uh, two H2s, and water, and you're going to make two water molecules, and you're going to get energy when it happens. Um, so widespread use of hydrogen for powering the motor vehicles, heating buildings, and producing electricity would eliminate most of the outdoor air pollution that comes from burning of fossil fuels, because hydrogen, uh, hydrogen is only water vapor. So you're not going to have any emissions. You're not going to have any uh, pollution coming off of this. Using hydrogen fuel would also reduce the threat of climate change, right? Because you're not you're not putting out any carbon dioxide emissions, as long as now this is the key part, as long as the hydrogen that you're using for the fuel is not made with fossil fuels or nuclear. Okay, the hydrogen is also going to get a lot of more energy per gram than any other fuel. Boom, a lot of energy. All right, um, which means because it's hydrogen, it's very light. It'd be ideal for uh, rocket fuel I mean uh, airline fuel okay that's awesome all right so but there are quite a few challenges as far as getting hydrogen made as fuel okay we are it has a ton of promises but there's a lot of issues to be overcome first okay so turning hydrogen into a major fuel source is challenging for many reasons first there's hardly any hydrogen loose in the atmosphere or if you've ever done, if you remember, you're doing the um, the remember when you were in middle school and probably in um, some of your earlier sciences, you were listing all the gases in the the um, Earth's atmosphere. Hydrogen was not one of them. There's very very little hydrogen loose in the atmosphere, but we can produce hydrogen. I mean, easily enough, sort of easily. Um, we are going to um, okay. Uh, pause. All right, so I kind of got distracted. Let me see if I can figure out where we are. All right, so first, okay, yeah. So this is how we're going to make hydrogen, okay? You're going to heat the water really hot or pass an electrical current through the water. Um, you can also uh, strip it from methane. You see that CH4? All right, you can take the hydrogen right off the methane uh, that's found in natural gas and gasoline molecules or from rotting plants. Um, you can also uh, do a chemical reaction on it, which involves coal, oxygen, and steam. Now, all three of these are very energy-intensive processes. They take a lot of energy to make it happen. That's one of the worst things about hydrogen fuel. It has a negative uh, net energy because it takes so much high-quality energy and work to get the hydrogen available to be used. You get a lot more, it takes a lot more energy to get hydrogen than we actually get by burning it. And we do get a lot of energy when we burn it. It takes even more than that to get the hydrogen to start with. So cost is another challenge. The fuel cells are the best way to use the hydrogen to get your electricity. But the current versions of the hydrogen fuel cells are very, very expensive. So progress in the development of nanotechnology could bring the price down and again if they would start subsidizing the right people okay helping to pay for the research and development of this stuff then the cost would go way down if they would start subsidizing the right people so the challenges for hydrogen the production methods for the fuel can also be problematic all right so the electricity from coal burning and nuclear power plants is what is used to decompose water into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, so you want to, so you can take the water and just get the hydrogen out of it. All right, but you're going to need electricity from coal burning or nuclear power plants 
and we don't want to be using coal burning or nuclear power plants. So if you're using coal and nuclear, um, you know, you're damaging the environment and doing all the awful things that we talked about. Now, if you're using solar or wind electricity, that's a possibility there if you're using solar or wind. Um, if you're making coal from making hydrogen from coal or stripping it off of methane or gasoline, it's also going to add a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. The process of making this happen is going to release a lot of greenhouse gases um, per unit of heat generated, even more than for burning the coal or methane directly. Then finally, the hydrogen gas is flammable. Hydrogen is very, very flammable. The whole reason you're making engines out of it is because you can burn it. Okay, but the safety is a big concern in the production of it because of the fire damage, fire possibilities. So for now, hydrogen's negative net energy is a serious limitation. The fuel is going to have to be heavily subsidized for it to be able to compete in the open market. And of course, you know they're not going to subsidize any of our green energies. Okay, there's promising new technology, however. It's called an artificial leaf. It's about as big as a credit card and it um, will take um, hydrogen and oxygen when you place it in a glass of tap water and expose it to sunlight. This is so weird. All right, so they call it an artificial leaf. It's about as big as a credit card. It's silicone, which is the same stuff that the solar panels are made out of, but it's like, you know, made a different way. And you're going to get hydrogen and oxygen separated off of a water molecule when you put it in sunlight. And there's also an electrical, electrochemical cell that's being developed that mimics photosynthesis by using the sun's energy to split the water molecules and produce hydrogen fuel. So this artificial leaf and this electrochemical cell, they are very similar, okay, and very promising because it's just using sunlight and these, these special little wafer things. But scaling up either of these processes to produce large amounts of, of hydrogen at an, an affordable price, um, with an acceptable net energy uh, is going to be needed. It's going to be going to take for the sex for the next sec several decades. Okay, so let me read that again. Again, my face is in the. I'm looking over here on the side because it's up on my board. So scaling up either of these processes to produce large amounts of hydrogen at an affordable price with acceptable net energy over the next several decades could help implement the solar energy. Okay, I see what it's saying. All right, so if we could do this, this is going to go a long way towards. Um, helping the solar energy factor of sustainability. All right, so this is what a fuel cell sort of looks like, okay? This is the hydrogen gas going in, all right? And then you do the, so at this point, this is where the electricity comes for the car, okay? And then from here, you're taking oxygen from the atmosphere. This is how it's driven, how the electricity is driven. So as this tries to combine with the oxygen to make the water, it's gonna pull these others through here. And then you again coming out the tailpipe is nothing but pure water. So the hydrogen is a clean energy source as long as in order to get the hydrogen, you're not using fossil fuels. Do not use fossil fuels to get this hydrogen and then you've got something good. But right now it has a negative net energy because how much energy it takes to make this happen. All right. So right now it's not really good. But those two options, the um, artificial leaf and the fake photosynthesis. So hydrogen as a fuel eliminates almost all of the air pollution problems. It's going to reduce the threats to global warming. Um, the hydrogen is chemically locked in water and other organic compounds, so we have to pull the hydrogen off. Um, and then carbon, di carbon dioxide levels of the process is going to be dependent on the method of production, meaning if we're using fossil fuels to get the hydrogen off the water so we can use it, you're not doing a good job. But if we have... Um, if we are able to get this electricity through green energy sources, then it, the electricity to make the hydrogen fuel through green sources, then it might be worth considering. So the advantages, it can be produced from plentiful water at some sites. No carbon dioxide emissions if it's produced using renewables. It's a good substitute for oil and it's very high efficiency um, in fuel cells. It has a negative net energy because of how much energy it takes to make the fuel. The carbon dioxide emissions, if you're going to produce it from the carbon containing compounds, you need subsidies due to the negative net energy and you need hydrogen storage and distribution center systems. So when your hydrogen fuel cell needs more hydrogen fuel, where do you go get it? Okay, so that's going to be a problem there. 
So here's our main ideas for this chapter. Okay, first, the subsidies for the non-renewables, this is the bad stuff, the subsidies for the non-renewables like fossil fuels are going to give buyers a false impression of the true cost of energy. Because the government pays the bills for these fossil fuel guys, we don't realize how big the bills are. Okay, and so the renewable energy sources like solar, wind, hydropower, thermal, geothermal heat, biomass, biofuel, and hydrogen fuel, um, they're going to reduce the dependence on fossil fuels and reduce the harmful environmental impacts. The solar energy, of course, comes directly from the sun. You have the passive and active uses of the solar energy that can heat buildings and water. And then the solar thermal systems can concentrate sunlight to produce a high temperature to heat, uh, high temperature heat, and then um, enough to boil water to make electricity. The photovoltaic cells convert sunlight directly into electricity. You don't have to boil water or spin turbines. You go turning exact straight into electricity because the 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 material in there gets agitated in the sunlight and shoots off electrons. And once you have one, you have the others, like we talked about earlier. Okay, so it converts the sunlight directly into energy, and it's the world's fastest growing technology for producing electricity. Hydropower, water, is any techno technology that uses kinetic energy for flowing water to make your electricity. And then wind. Uh, wind turbines capture energy from blowing winds over land or sea. Wind power is the second fastest growing technology. Then moving on to biomass, which can be burned for fuel. And biomass can also be converted into liquid biofuels like ethanol and biodiesel. Geothermal energy is heat stored in the soil, underground rocks, and fluids in the mantle. And then hydrogen as a gas, as a fuel, hydrogen gas as a fuel is not yet a good alternative to fossil fuels because it has a negative net energy, but there are a lot of te new technologies being developed. All right, now. So as we go through through here, um, this chapter, again, you're focusing on these are the, the focus, not just for my class, but as you move into the future, um, you and MLGW are going to have a serious relationship for the rest of your lives. You need you're going to need energy and electricity and you're going to need to be able to make decisions based on what we need to do for the nation. OK, when you're making uh, when you're voting and making policies and and some of you guys may be able to, like I like I've been saying, some of you guys might be able to just go ahead and be the ones to invest in the wind farms, build the wind farms, do all of this stuff, create the smart grids. You guys might be the ones to make this stuff. OK, so um, I hope this I hope you understood a good bit of this and I hope you're doing really well um, and I'll see you the next time.